thank you for the invitation to speak in the meeting. Um, I received particularly a letter from uh, uh, Tony and uh, uh, my Kim, so I want to thank them for, um, for the invitation. So I'm going to talk to you about the work that we're doing in the lab um, regarding HIF inhibition. And I modify, as you can see, it'll be the title is not called uh, uh, HIF biology, but it is called HIF targeting in the case of renal cell carcinoma. The latest data from the TCGA that we're all uh, um, aware about um, point to three broad categories of uh, um, uh, uh, molecules that they are deregulated in the case of renal cell carcinoma and they can be potentially targeted. So chromatin modulators is a very new and expanding space and chromatin modulators are enzymes that they are losing their activity in the case of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, so we're waiting for identification of critical targets um, uh, down stream that they are upregulated in order to inhibit them. mTOR uh, has been tried already in the clinic. Um, it has some uh, significant success, uh, modest success, most probably not related um, uh, uh, to the inhibition uh, of HIF. So what we have been focusing for a, while, for a while in the lab is an effort to inhibit HIF um, in renal cell carcinoma. The deletion of EHL, as we all are aware about, the deletion of EHL uh, leads to a constitutive increase um, uh, in HIF expression. And I would like to make a few points here is that independently of the downstream modifiers of the chromatin or other secondary mutations that they required for the development of renal cell carcinoma, one of the background uh, effects is the deletion of EHL in about 90% of the cases of RCC. Moreover, there are very uh, uh, intense preclinical data and clear data that they say that if we reintroduce VHL or if we inhibit HIF in cells that they are missing VHL, uh, we're leading to tumor suppression. And again, uh, this is preclinical data. One more caveat here before I present you the data about the HIF inhibitors that we have is that there are two paralogs of HIF, two family members of HIF, as you know, HIF 1 alpha and HIF 2 alpha. Um, there are data that are accumulating now for the last 10 years that I think they're quite compelling that HIF 2 alpha is the oncogenic driver. Uh, there is evidence that the HIF 1 alpha is a tumor suppressor, or if it is not a tumor suppressor, at least plays a secondary role in the case of um, uh, uh, development of renal cell uh, carcinoma. So I think that HIF2 alpha is a validated target, as we all know. And the last point I would like to make is that we heard so many in this meeting about inhibitors that they are in the, uh, in the clinic right now, that what they do is that they inhibit downstream targets of HIF. So we talk about the GF inhibition, PDGF inhibition, FGF inhibition, kind of a one by one inhibition of downstream targets of HIF. I will submit to you that when I hear the talks about uh, potential uh, resistance in uh, treatment of renal cell carcinoma with these inhibitors, the first thing that comes to my mind is that HIF has approximately 60 downstream targets. So inhibiting two or three or four of them leaves me with approximately 57 reasons to tell you why these tumors develop resistance uh, in the receptor tyrosine kinase that we currently hit. So an adventurous approach that we took a few years uh, in the lab was to go and directly attempt to uh, inhibit HIF2 alpha. I'm not going to present data that presented in the previous meetings in which I showed that we did develop small molecule inhibitors. We have done this by a, um, a, a cell based screen. What we know about these inhibitors is that they can inhibit the HIF expression in every renal cell carcinoma cell line, which is VHL negative. We know that they can inhibit HIF expression in every uh, cell line that has been induced to hypoxia with very few um, uh, um, uh, uh, exceptions. And we know a lot about the mechanism of action. And the mechanism of action is what they do. This is the, these inhibitors, and I, this is the red dot of the inhibitor, is that they inhibit HIF translation. This is an mTOR independent translation of HIF. It occurs from an internal ribosomal entry site of the 5-UTR mRNA of HIF. And the way that they inhibit it is by precipitating on the mRNA of HIF this protein, um, which is called IRP1, iron response, iron regulatory protein 1. It has been named this way because it has been identified initially um, uh, uh, through regulation of, of iron, and this IRP1 binds to the mRNA of HIF and inhibits the translation. 
So a VHL negative cell line, a VHL negative tumor, will have decreased availability of the HIF2 alpha protein when it's treated with these inhibitors in principle because they, inhi they inhibit the translation of HIF. What I'm going to present, we would like to present right now, is that unpublished data from our laboratory, but has been quite gratifying and give us an enthusiasm about these inhibitors because what it says is that they do work in vivo. And the way we try them is that we didn't try them in the classic xenograft tumor um, uh, model in the mouse because they, they, they have um, uh, limited bioavailability and therefore they need the appropriate modification. But we went in an animal model that actually mimics VHL disease, and this is the zebrafish animal model. This is a fish. I know this kind of a weird in a uh, so clinical meeting to present a fish, but the fish has many um, actually phenotypes of the VHL disease. So this is a VHL uh, negative fish, and uh, it develops increased angiogenesis. It develops erythrocytosis. Um, it develops uh, an increased size of the liver and the kidney, not frank kidney cancer. Um, and also it has cardiomegaly and edema, and it has a life, a short lifespan, because this fish dies, the embryo of this fish dries approximately at 10 days due to all these physiologic changes. I put here the human um, uh, uh, cartoon because many of these features that I talked to you about the fish, they're actually encountered in, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the patients that they have VHL disease. So, we tried, we took this fish, and the other way to, 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 to make it to mimic the VHL disease is to treat it with a chemical, this chemical is called DMOG, um, that poisons uh, the prolyhydroxylases that they deregulate here. So if we treat a wild type fish with this inhibitor, the DMOG, we make it appear if it has VHL. And we stained it here with a stain that stains red cells, and therefore by staining red cells, we can actually quantify the erythrocytosis, and we can quantify also the development of the vessels. So we can train a computer uh, algorithm to look at these dots into the fish, uh, objectively quantify the intensity, and then we can treat the fish with the HIF2 alpha inhibitor, and so that we can significantly decrease the effect um, of HIF in erythrocytosis and um, uh, in, in vascular development. We can do the same thing exactly with a VHL fi negative fish without treatment with the with, uh, with inhibitor. Here is the VHL negative fish. This is the VHL fish that's, um, uh, that's positive. Uh, you can see that the redness is more intense. This is exactly because they develop uh, blood vessels and because they also develop erythrocytosis. Again, we can treat with the inhibitor and we have a significant reduction of the staining, which is the combined effect on, on the erythrocytosis and the vascular development. We can deconvolute this effect into an effect on the blood vessels or an effect into the red cells. And we deconvolute it this way. We cross this fish with another um, uh, fish that has um, uh, green vessels. It has been engineered genetically so that it has green vessels. And what we see is that the VHL negative fish now, we can mark the vessels, develops tumor lesions, angiogenic lesions in the brain in the retina and in the body. So we see this, the proliferation, the very uh, intense vascular proliferation that we see with uh, um, uh, the loss of VHL in the tumors or with the angiogenic lesions in the VHL patients. And again, when we treat with the drug, we reduce the intensity of this vascular proliferation and we in, in, reduce the size of the tumors. Finally, we can follow, we can bleed the fish um, and we can count the erythrocytes, and we can count actually the mature forms and the mature form, immature forms of the erythrocytes. And we, what we can show is that by applying this HIF inhibitor, we promote the maturation of the erythrocytes. And we promote the maturation because it's a characteristic of the HIF expression that induces an immaturity um, uh, in, in, in the blood cell uh, development. So this combined effect on the vascularity, on all the HIF targets that we looked, uh, translate into physiological changes in this fish. Um, the VHL negative fish has a decreased cardiac contractility. And when we treat with an inhibitor, we actually improve the cardiac contractility. And finally, we do improve the overall survival of the fish that died significantly later um, when we treat them with HIF2-alpha inhibitors. So, 
I'm showing you this data to tell you that this is the first uh, evidence that we have that we can actually treat with a pharmacologic uh, HIF2 alpha inhibitor, an animal model that mimics the VHL disease and potentially mimics aspects of the uh, human renal cell carcinoma, and that we can actually improve this phenotype of the VHL disease. This is not, this is only a lead compound. We are doing chemical synthesis of this compound right now, modifications, and I can tell you that the first modified um, derivatives of this compound have a, um, a higher uh, efficiency without having um, any toxicity. Um, this study is well controlled. Other drugs that they inhibit HIF1 alpha, they don't do, uh, they don't induce these effects. And actually, um, uh, when we use chemical compounds that they're modified so that in the mama, in, in the in the tissue culture, do not inhibit HIF2 alpha, we do not see this amelioration in the effect in the fish. So I'm moving to the second target. This is one way that we think that it's possible to directly target the HIF. I'm moving the rest of the time in the second target. Um, and the se second target is actually um, uh, became clear to us when we started the effects of hypoxia and HIF on the metabolism. And there is a dramatic reprogramming of the tumor metabolism by HIF. So the normal cell that you can see here depends um, on glucose uh, for very significant cell functions. The cell takes glucose. Um, Amato presented some of this pathway through the GLUT1, takes it into the um, uh, mitochondria, use it is, uses glucose as a fuel in this mitochondrial grinder, and produces molecules that they are necessary for the cell uh, to produce biomass to increase the fatty acids, the DNA, and the amino acids. And this combination gives the, the ability to the cell. I'm sorry, the, uh, to the cell the ability to um, increase the mass and, and, and to divide. In the same time, it produces energy. So when we expose cells to hypoxia, we see what has been well known to us as a Warburg phenomenon. So the hypoxic cells do not put glucose into the mitochondria, but instead they shovel it over to the lactate. They divert the glucose. And therefore, at the first glance, the question pops, how does a cell now that it cannot use the, the, the glucose as a fuel produces the nutrients to increase its mass? How does it produce its biomass? And at the same time, how does it produce the energy? So we visited this question, and we visited, as you understand very well, because the VHL negative cells have a fixed phenotype in hypoxia because they expressed HIV. We were doing that with specific metabolic tracers. We can trace, we can label glucose, we can label other nutrients, we can label glutamine, we can put in the cell culture, that we can crack the cell open, and trace the pathway through which glucose or other nutrients enter what is called here the central carbon metabolism. So to make the story short, what we have shown is that the VHL negative cells, so the renal cell carcinoma cells, have a very impressive phenotype. Instead of using glucose to create this biomass, they're using glutamine. And they're using glutamine through two pathways. One of them is that they enter glutamine to the Krebs cycle that we all remember from medical school, and it goes through the oxidative pathway. But they also are using glutamine in a reverse way. Uh, it's the first time, actually, that we describe this in a mammalian cell system. It has been known and described in bacteria, but glutamine can go through this pathway that's called reductive carboxylation, and then it's been used as a fuel for the biomass production. Um, why is this happening? The hypoxia cells actually in HIF transactivate all these enzymes. One of them is PDK1. And PDK1 blocks the entrance of glucose into the cells. This is a fixed defect that the VHL negative cell has, and therefore presents a potential opportunity to use it for therapy. This is not a subtle phenomenon. In blue, you see the contribution of glucose, and in red, the contribution of glutamine into the biomass production in hormoxia and hypoxia. Every cell line that we test is normoxia and hypoxia behaves this way, and all the renal cell carcinoma cell lines behave this way. We want to show that this depends on HIF, um, uh, and the, the HIF expression, the HIF2 alpha expression specifically, is necessary and it's sufficient uh, for the induction of this phenomenon. We went further um, into analyzing the mechanism, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time for the, uh, because of, uh, of the time limitations, but I think we understand why this is happening. This is happening because the metabolism of the cell has a plasticity. If you take the glucose, you block the entrance into the mitochondria, you throw it into the lactate, you create a deficiency inside the mitochondria. And the deficiency that drives this reaction is citrate. 
So if you don't feed it, the citrate levels drop. And because the citrate levels drop, they turn the reaction the other way from glutamine, and they create this reductive carboxylation. This is not an in vitro only phenomenon. It happens only in vivo. We put tumors, human tumors in mice, we label the mice with glucose and with glutamine, and we show that the renal cell carcinoma quickly take the, the glutamine out of the blood and they use it uh, to feed the vessels and other amino acids. So it's not a surprise that TCDA uh, data that they came actually very recently into publications show a significant deregulation of the glycolytic pathway and the pathway of the mitochondrial enzymes. I have two more uh, slides. We can block this pathway in principle, and this is the reasonable thing to do. Glutamine utilizes an enzyme to go from glutamine to glutamate, which is a necessary step to enter the mitochondria um, and, and perform this feeding, the fueling of the mass. And if we block this enzyme um, uh, with uh, a glutaminase inhibitor, and there are several of them uh, available um, uh, uh, pharmaceutically, we can show that the VHL deficient cells preferentially are killed over the, v the cells that they express uh, uh, their VHL positive, exactly because they have this fixed defect that does not allow them to replace the shortage of glutamine um, with glucose. It works in vivo, so if you inject mice with, with renal cell carcinoma, you can actually let, lead to tumor suppression by treating the cells with glutaminase inhibitor. These data are with inhibitors that they're kind of in a quote, quote, dirty, um, but there are clinical grade inhibitors that actually they're approaching the, uh, the market right now, and we are uh, partnering with a, a pharmaceutical company to, to try some of these uh, clinical grade inhibitors. So I present you two potential targets, one HIF to alpha itself, and the other one uh, the glutaminase, which is the consequence of the metabolic deregulation of the cell uh, by HIF. These are the persons that are working in my lab, and these are many of my collaborators that they help with the studies. Paolo Gamero led the metabolic studies. Um, uh, Anna Metello is leading uh, the HIF2 inhibitor studies uh, in the fish that I show you, and I thank you very much for your attention.